Um, um, my name is Dr. F. Papagiropoulou. I'm an associate professor at the School of Earth and Environment uh, in the University of Leeds. I'm interested in uh, food uh, systems, sustainability, and uh, food security. I'll be chairing the meeting today. Um, I'm also the program lead for the MSc in Sustainable uh, Food Systems um, at the University of Leeds. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this virtual uh, seminar of the Global Food and Environment Institute. And the title of, of this seminar is An Evaluation Tool for Assessing the Impacts of Food Hubs. And it will be presented by Dr. Gemma Bridge. Um, Gemma is passionate about health and well-being of people and places. Um, she is a, a research assistant on the Food Hubs project here at the University of Leeds. This presentation is a part of, of, um, of that project. Um, she's also involved in other research projects. She's very active um, across other universities, um, such as uh, York St. John's University, Leeds Beckett University. Um, and she's uh, seeking to explore and promote health and sustainability in the UK. That's the overarching uh, thing that connects all these different activities. Um, Gemma is also the director of Bridge Research. Um, which is a company that works with charities and organizations to promote public health, physical activity and sustainability. Outside of work, Gemma is the running mayor of West Yorkshire, um, advocating for more people to run some of their everyday journeys. And she's also a keen trail and mountain runner and last being creative through collage. So not just an amazing researcher, but lots of other interests as well. Um, a little bit about the Global Food and Environment Institute, GFEI, who's hosting this series. It's an interdisciplinary research community that brings together academics, uh, people from industry and public policy to work on integrated challenges of food security and climate change. For further information, please visit our website. Um, Sarah has posted quite a lot of the links already in the chat. So this seminar, um, seminar is part of a series of seminars um, hosted by and organized by JFI. And for future uh, uh, seminars, please have a look on the, the link uh, and ticket source that will be advertised and you can book um, on there. Um, before I introduce Gemma, just a little bit, remind you of the seminar etiquette. Please ensure that your camera and uh, microphones are switched off for the duration of the seminar. Um, the presentation will take about 20 minutes and at the end of it, uh, we will have 10 minutes of uh, Q&A. Any questions, please post them on the chat function and I will be uh, combining them and um, asking Gemma um, about them. Um, also, may I remind you that the seminar is being recorded uh, and it will be made available on uh, YouTube if you want to watch it again. So without further ado, I'll introduce you um, to Dr. Gemma Bridge and hand you over for her excellent presentation. Thank you, Gemma. Over to you. Perfect. Thank you very much for the introduction, Effie. So as Effie said, my name is Gemma Bridge. Um, I'm a public health and sustainability researcher, and I worked with Effie on the Food Hubs project. We worked in collaboration with Foodwise Leeds and Leeds City Council, and also took a participatory approach, working as often as we possibly could with Food Hubs across the city. <clears throat> Sorry, right. So in today's session, we're going to look at the second phase of the research project that we undertook. In this phase, we focused on the development of an evaluation toolkit for food hubs. We will start by providing some context to the area, looking at what food hubs are and how they are working across the city. We will then move on to look at our process for developing an evaluation toolkit and spend some time looking at the toolkit itself and what it covers. I'll then show you a case study where we put the toolkit into, into practice to highlight how it can work in real life. And finally, we'll conclude the session by looking at some of the limitations of the toolkit as well as its potential for impact. So first, context. So what are food hubs? Well, for this research project, we define them as a, as a range of organisations that sit between the people who produce the food and those who use it. Typically, food hubs have a social, ethical or charitable purpose and aim to support the communities within which they are situated. Examples of food hubs include food banks, food pantries, 
community cafes, community cooperatives, and, uh, and community farms. Food hubs offer a range of support services to their communities, such as food aid, food redistribution, cooking skills, and financial advice. So food hubs and food insecurity. Food insecurity is when people do not have access to adequate nutritious food to meet their needs. In the UK, food insecurity has increased over recent years, and now over 18% of households suffer from food insecurity. There are food hubs all over the UK, with more arising over recent years, largely in relation to the increases in food insecurity. Food hubs play an important role in supporting those suffering from food insecurity to access vital support and food. They also deliver a wide range of social, economic and environmental benefits. So, developing the evaluation toolkit. Why did we develop an impact evaluation toolkit? Well, food hubs are typically third sector organisations with limited time and financial resources. This makes it hard to monitor and evaluate their impacts. Therefore, despite the number of food hubs in the UK and the range of benefits that they offer, there is a lack of documented evidence of their impacts. As, as such, food hubs can struggle to demonstrate to funders and other supporting organisations why they need support. We wanted to produce an impact evaluation toolkit that could be used by food hubs to capture insights into their impacts without placing too much stress on them financially or in terms of their time. So how did we develop this toolkit? The development of the toolkit involved working collaboratively with food hubs in Leeds. We undertook an online survey with food hubs across the city to identify the range of impacts that they have in their communities. We then further explored these impacts through focus groups and interviews, enabling us to develop an evaluation matrix. After further conversations with food hubs, as well as with the council and Foodwise Leads, we refined this into an evaluation toolkit which we made as user-friendly and as accessible as possible. We had support and for the design and communication from research retold. So here is the evaluation toolkit. You can access and download it from this link here. There should also be links in the chat that you can access to be able to find the resources. So the toolkit begins with an explanation of what the toolkit involves and how to use it. We wanted to make sure that those that just came across the toolkit or heard about it from others were able to pick it up and put it into practice easily. So this page here is the front page as you open the toolkit. So you can see it. So the toolkit's available kind of as a printable version and as an online version. Both versions, this is the, the front page as you open it. So step one of the toolkit is about deciding which program or activity to evaluate. We suggested that Food Hubs focused on one activity or programme at a time to make the evaluation process easier. We realised that Food Hubs often offer several different uh, activities or programmes, but trying to evaluate all of them at the same time was something that Food Hubs said was really challenging for them. So examples of the activities or programmes that Food Hubs could select to evaluate are a community cafe offering, community cooking skills classes, community groups, composting, food growing, those kind of things. We also included additional lines there for food hubs themselves to add additional offers that they have that haven't been included in the list. So within the toolkit, we have grouped impacts um, that we identified from the previous phases of research into four groups or four areas. So the first area is sustainability and resilience. This includes things like food waste, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by using locally grown food uh, and seasonal products, supporting biodiversity by composting and those kind of things. So all of the impacts that we've listed here are, are factors that came out from the interviews that we had with food hubs and identified as, as fact activities that they do. We also added to this with literature that we found by, based on what other food hubs are doing so that we can make this as, as inclusive as possible. So in the next column after impacts, it's about frequency. This asks how often the food hubs do this activity or program. So we ask them to say never, sometimes, always, every day, once a month to indicate the frequency of that activity. 
Next, we have indicators. So this is about the metrics that they could use to measure this, the effect or the outcomes of their of their program. So, for example, if it was about using surplus food to develop or to make meals to give away, this is something they might be doing every day. And then as an indicator, it would be the number of meals provided. The next column is about evidence. So this is about what information the food hubs have in order to support the effect of that impact or of that program. So, for example, they could say they could record how many meals they're serving every day. So on average, it's 50 meals a day, for example. And then the final column is about comments. So here we ask the food hubs as they're evaluating to look and to reflect upon what they could potentially do to increase the impact of their food hub or how to capture more of the evidence or impact of that program. So, for example, here we we say uh, the food hubs say that they could capture information about the amount of surplus food they're using. Other examples could be uh, quotes from people that are receiving the meals or images or photographs, if possible, um, to show the meals that are being shared. <clears throat> Sorry. OK, so the next group of indicators is uh, namely health and well-being. So similarly to sustainability, section it's, it's similarly presented we have different impacts listed and we provide examples of different indicators but again um, it, it's the same format to make it as easy as possible so this section includes uh, impacts such as improving health improving emotional well-being improving quality of life emotional or work attainment uh, pr promotion of social connections and promote providing community activities so as with the previous group of impacts, we ask that food hubs add information to all the columns to ensure they can confidently share the impact and have evidence to support it. So the next group in the toolkit is the impacts about demand, access to and demand for healthy and local food. So this includes impacts such as access to land for food growing, supporting people to purchase healthy food and raising awareness of the impacts and the benefits of eating healthy and local food. So in, in terms of the impact suggestions, we've got, um, sorry, in terms of the indicator suggestions, we've got kind of areas of, of land for growing food. So in terms of hectares or acres, the number of people who access the food that contain fresh, healthy ingredients, types of dietary and cultural preferences considered. So, for example, does the food hub offer Caribbean or Eastern European type of food as well as as other other types um, and indicators such as the number of people attending food programs? Again, we include evidence and comments. So the final group of impacts is about food security and economy. This includes impacts such as contributing to food security, assisting with access to financial support, support and employing staff. Several of the food hubs were providing financial support via another organisation. So that's why we have a contribution there, but it's an important uh, impact that many of the food hubs were mentioning. So the indicators we've listed for this section include the number of food parcels provided, examples of advocacy campaigns and the number of staff employed. For all of the groups of impacts, we suggest that food hubs capture evidence that is both quantitative and qualitative. quantitative. So, for example, the number of food parcels or the number of people employed, as well as quotes or stories from recipients or employees. So. We put this talk into practice and developed case studies. After, after developing the evaluation toolkit, we invited a range of the food hubs that we worked with across Leeds to work with us to put the toolkit into practice. To do this, we undertook site visits, interviews, observations, and we also produced case studies as one page documents, which we called spotlights, that we shared with food hubs that they could use for funding or impact cases. The purpose of these case studies was to share knowledge and showcase best practice. So these are the 10 food hubs across Leeds that we worked with to put the, the toolkit into practice. They represent a range of food hubs and, and types of different types of food hubs across the city. So we have community farms, we have small community cafes, we have food banks and food pantries. So I realise this is potentially tricky to read, um, but it shows an example of one of putting the toolkit into practice. So we worked with Meanwood Valley Farm, which is a community farm in Meanwood, um, and we 
captured all this information through visiting the farm, speaking to staff and volunteers, undertaking observations of their work, and making notes about the range of activities that they offer. So this shows the access and demand for healthy local food uh, section of their toolkit. This is something that Meanwood Valley Farm is working hard to promote. As one of the examples of the impacts that they have in their community is their community allotments. So these allotments provide space for people to grow food and learn about how, how to grow food. The allotments are available to use every day and as a measure of their impact, they suggested the size of the space and the number of allotments available. So as you look at the toolkit, they, for example, as an impact, provide access to land. The frequency is every day, the indicators, size of the garden and the number of allotment spaces. And then when we asked about the evidence, they have collected photos of the space and the number of people that have access to the allotments. So they have a 72 bed uh, market garden area covering an acre. And then we worked with Meanwood Valley Farm to go through all of the different groups of impacts and produce sheets like this for every single one. Um, these sheets can then be used by the farm to evidence their impact when applying for funding or reporting back to funders or indeed to communicating to the community. So after we after we produced this kind of toolkit with the, each of the different food hubs, we then worked with them to produce a case study spotlight. So this is an example of one from New Wortley Community Centre, which is a, a food hub based in Wortley and Armley. Um, and it helps us to spotlight and provide an overview of the activities and impacts that each of the food hubs have. So we made these for each of the different food hubs and it covers a, a simplified version of their activities that they offer, the different impacts that they are providing and providing some takeaways in terms of uh, the practice that they're doing and what works well for them and could potentially work well for other food hubs. So impact and limitations of the impact evaluation toolkit for food hubs. Whilst we've worked hard to produce the evaluation toolkit and have tried to ensure that it's easy to use, does not require lots of time or resources and can be utilised now and in the future, it is not without limitations. We found that many of the food hubs don't routinely collect data, and this is a challenge for using the toolkit. Food hubs will need to build data collection into their normal processes to make using the evaluation toolkit easier for them. We also found that supporting them in capturing the data and identifying ways in which they can capture that data was helpful. Time is also something that's limiting. As mentioned, we've tried to make sure this toolkit is as easy and quick to use, but as it does need to be done, in addition to other tasks, it may place some additional times demands on staff and or volunteers. We suggested that the food hubs work as and when they can on the toolkit rather than doing it all at the end of a programme or project to make sure that it's as time efficient as possible. And the final limitation that we've identified is in order for it to be use, most useful, they need to be doing it, using it regularly. And whilst this this may be challenging if they are already stretched for time and might find it unfeasible. However, despite the limitations, the toolkit does have many potential benefits, benefits and impacts. It can be used by food hubs to demonstrate impact as it will ensure that the food hubs can show others what they're doing and how and that they have evidence to support it. The toolkit can be used to develop stronger funding bids and in turn help to support, secure financial support and finally, it can be used to inform the strategy of food hubs. It can show where food hubs are making the biggest impacts and where additional efforts could be placed. So we've made all of the resources available online. Uh, they're free to download and use. And we are planning to continue our work across other parts of the country and aim to further develop the toolkit. We're just starting a new project now to explore how the toolkit can be used by food hubs outside of Leeds. So the links are here, but I believe they're also in the chat. So thank you very much for your time and listening. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I'll pass over to Effie. Yeah, 
Thank you very much, um, Gemma. As I'm starting to, yeah, here we go. I made um, sure the video. So thank you. That has been uh, brilliant. There is a, a, there are a number of questions. There's lots of interest, um, which is uh, fantastic. So I'll just go through first um, Sarah's question about whether we have a similar tool focusing primarily on the sustainability aspects. So um, the carbon. Um, impact of school meals. Alexa has very kindly responded already um, that so there is a carbon calculator and she has posted um, the link on the chat. So that could be a very, uh, it's a specific tool that has been developed for school meals and um, uh, calculating the, the, the climate impact. Um, so Millie um, also mentioned about um, whether we have managed to uh, combine all this evidence to demonstrate the collective impact of food hubs um, in, in, in this work. Sure. So, I mean, we've worked with several different organisations across Leeds and we have put together some academic papers and reports to, to summarise that. But it's just in Leeds. So we are working with the council for that project um, and have developed a report and a policy brief which is available through the links um, but in addition we are now kind of developing this project into a more national scale and we'll work with more different food hubs more food uh, and place-based food kind of initiatives more broadly and I think through that next phase of research we'll have a broader and wider array of different food hubs we're working with so hopefully we'll be developing a, a kind of data set or a, a resource a repository of information which would be really good to share and to highlight kind of what works, what doesn't work so well, what different types of food hubs are doing um, to kind of demonstrate that impact and, and how they're doing that. Yeah, that, that's lovely. Thank you, Gemma. Um, also, Amber was asking uh, whether those 10 case studies that you mentioned, whether uh, you helped them uh, filling um, the the toolkit, the, the, you know, with them, whether there were any challenges that you noticed, especially when we are asking people to return that um, on their own, um, to fill it that in on, on their own. So uh, how's that? I think you touched upon that towards the mm -hmm. end. Yeah, sure. So we worked with food hubs for these 10 case studies that we, we did on this previous project. We worked with them. So either we, when we visited them, we did it in person and worked through a paper version of the, the toolkit, which is, is possible. And I mean, some, some food hubs, for example, that are working as a single person or as a very small team, they found that, that when they were there they could make notes on a piece of paper that they liked for others we worked with them online um, and did it kind of via zoom or teams um, working through a interactive excel spreadsheet which they can fill in and again the the pdf version of the toolkit is is fillable um, so for them when we were working through it with them that worked really well um, i think moving forward it is it has been done and there's kind of the toolkit itself has instructions or a guidance document that should help food hubs to be able to fill it in. Um, but I think in terms of challenges, it may be that if this is very, very new to some food hubs, it may just be something that they need to fit in to the other uh, the other kind of things they're doing already. So I think the challenge really is just finding that time. But in terms of using the toolkit, we didn't get any feedback that it was difficult to use. Um, we've made it as accessible as possible, working with Research Retold to make sure that it meets all accessibility needs in terms of, so it's it's user friendly in that regard. Um, I think it's just if, if some of the, the metrics or impacts that we've listed are unfamiliar, it may just be that there needs to be a, a session or a way of, of sharing, sharing knowledge and learning, but hopefully through sessions such as this we can help and then we've also got um, uh, contact details to be able to share some more insights that way. Brilliant, uh, thank you Gemma. Um, another interesting um, and insightful comment by Lena and she was saying whether we um, accounted any um, any shame um, mm -hmm. when, when you, you were doing the interviews um, with the food hubs of you know people assuming using uh, the food hubs um sure. so i mean when we were developing the toolkit we were working primarily with volunteers or staff members of the food hubs um so we didn't talk to those using the food hubs um but i think it would be something that kind of in the next phase of research or whether we 
ingrained into into weaving that into the the next phase of research because i think it's important that we're making sure that we're capturing all of the different impacts but in terms of experiencing or hearing from others experiencing it we didn't hear that and i think a lot of the food hubs are trying to move more towards kind of sustainability and supporting their communities in a in a positive way obviously some of that is helping to continue to provide food for those that are unable to afford it but there's also cookery lessons that's open to anybody cookery lessons or community groups so it was a very positive experience in the conversations um i think you do hear about shame and stigma about attending especially food banks um but it, from my perspective and from speaking to the staff and what it is it was a very positive experience yeah, lovely. Thank you. Um, it is a very common theme, especially when you know people have to access um, support with securing their meals um, through different routes that maybe previously they haven't had to. Um, also, another follow-up um, common um, question from Amber: um, How frequently um, are the tool, the the food hubs expected to fill that in? How what's the flexibility in using um, you know that that um, toolkit? Sure. So when we were working with the different food hubs for the previous project, different food hubs had different approaches that they were planning to use. So Meanwood, for example, they work on a kind of a long term project basis. So, for example, they have their community gardens, which run all year. Um, and they were saying that they would be collecting evidence and impacts as they go. So they'd fill in the the impacts column and they'd fill in the metrics and then collect evidence of those things throughout the year. Other food hubs, for example, like Kamara, they offer shorter term programs or projects like community cookery lessons that were kind of fixed term, six to 12 weeks. And when we were speaking to them, they were saying that they would probably capture some evidence as they go, but complete the toolkit at the end of that six to eight week project. So I think, it, it I mean, the toolkit itself can be filled in as and when needed. And the fillable PDF or Excel spreadsheets can be returned to any time. So it really is kind of dependent on how the food hub works best or how they allocate time and resources to it. But it would probably be most time efficient if they can kind of come and go with it and collect that evidence throughout the program or project to make sure that they haven't got four hours or whatever it is at the end of the project to, to come back to it. Yeah, lovely. It, it is quite flexible, and it is up to the, the the food hubs themselves to to use it as 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 needed. Um, another interesting comment in terms of the the way that this toolkit was presented um, by Alexa, um, and she's asking how um, how have you made sure that the indicators uh, capture the the indicator capture is actually within the control of the provider? I'm assuming the provider here is the, is the food hub mm -hmm. or somebody from the food hub uh, uh, filling in that information recording increase of school performance as as an example seems a bit far fetched mm -hmm. just just bringing that as an example sure so school attainment was something that three of the food hubs mentioned as being something that they'd noted as being important as a as an indicator of their impact um and in terms of attainment they were measuring more in terms of like attendance completing school homework for example because a lot of the the children that they were, or your children and young people that they were speaking to just weren't attending school. So for them, attainment was, attend, school attendance would be something that they could measure as an indicator. Attainment in terms of grades at the end of the term was something that they noted and that the young people they were speaking to were saying something uh, that the food hub itself. So for example, they had a homework club. That was something that enabled them to, to be able to get back into school and get back on track. So that school attainment what that looks like for different food hubs may be different for some it may be school attendance for others it may be higher grades for others it may be more interest in something like reading but the indicators there are given as examples so they can delete them and they can fill that in however they wish um but attainment was something that a few of the food hubs mentioned as being something that they try and monitor and and measure as they go Lovely, thank you. Um, and another common uh, question um, from Sue. So um, she's saying, have the potential benefits of using the tool helped to address the, the resistance of data capture? I love the idea of tools to help people explain positively their impacts. So mm -hmm. has ha, ha, have you seen that sort of um, bit of it yet or is it quite early on? 
At the moment, no. I mean, we just finished the project a few months ago um, and the toolkit is now out there to be used. Um, and it would be great in this kind of next phase of the project as we as we move forward to go back and speak to some of the food hubs we worked with before to hear about what they're doing and how, how it's helping them. I mean, this toolkit was designed rather than a, a way to kind of monitor the food hubs in terms of like a regulatory process. It's much more about the positive impacts of them capturing what they're doing, how they're benefiting, and also to support them in moving to more sustainable projects or programs. So away from emergency food provision, which obviously is something that many of the food hubs need to continue doing, unfortunately, but it's also trying to support them to consider like, okay, we're providing food, but could we also look at maybe doing some sustainability? Could we compost some of the excess food that we're producing that we're not using? So in terms of regulations that's something we're not we're trying to move away from and it's more about helping the food hubs to monitor what they're doing positively to enable them to get funding or to speak to the community about what they're doing and how they need support or what they're offering so no short answer but um hopefully moving forward we'll be able to speak to food hubs about how they're using it and what what benefits they're getting from using the toolkit yeah, lovely. Thank you. Um, also, just to thank Alison for sharing um, their experiences in Wales, where um, uh, they supported the establishment of two community food hubs and they're using the Wellbeing Future Generations Acts framework. Looking forward to reading them. And, and for anybody interested, uh, she has added the link there. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, and then um, I think it was uh, Francesca that asked, Whenever there's a new comment, um, it moves the comment, so I'll, I'll lose it. Um, whether um, it covered audience beneficiaries, so for example, who, who, where the users, in a way, that type of information, is that captured in the toolkit? So that was something that food hubs say they already monitor. So all of the food hubs we spoke to said that they are, they have kind of registers or um, source information about who is using the food hubs. That was also something that they said that they didn't necessarily want to monitor in terms of like names and ages because it's already something they're doing. But if if that is something, so we're still in the refinement process of the toolkit. So if that comes out as being something that's like really important for food hubs, then we could always add an extra section where food hubs can can note uh, things about the people using it or the ages or the numbers. But also we can capture some of that in the evidence section. So if, for example, there's a a cooking class where they have 15 18 to 25 year olds attending they can capture that there but also at the end of the toolkit we have a, a page or a section for notes where different food hubs can can capture information but again it's a work in progress so we can refine as we go brilliant thank you also just to, to thank <laughs> there's a, a lovely conversation going on in the chat i wish you, you could see it obviously you need to focus on answering the questions uh, but thank you very much for Lindy, Johnny and Francesca sharing different um, things that are happening in this sphere. So um, Lindy is mentioning the food research collaboration at City, the University of London. Um, they ran a project on food hubs. Yes, they were very much uh, inspiration for, for this and we're building on, on their findings as well. And we compare what, what you know, um, what we find. So I'm answering the questions. <laughs> Sorry, I keep jumping That's in. Okay, it's good. <laughs> That, that's really useful but also Jamie is um added a, a link to the food ladders which is um uh a, again the comments keep jumping about um uh from um I'm assuming it's the one that yeah uh, in Sheffield University um and also Francesca has added um a link to the Leeds food resilience toolkit um as well so there's there's clearly a lot of interest in this area um and there's a lot of work being done and it's wonderful to see that and a lot of this work is very much co-produced co-designed and um, done together with community organizations which is uh, which is brilliant um and also jamie's adding food justice partnership link in the food future so there's a lot of uh, links that everybody um is more than welcome to uh, to to go and um, look into a bit more detail and it's wonderful to to see this as an opportunity to uh, uh, start this these conversations um so i think that's all the questions i managed to capture um so um and some other examples um there of other um, 
pieces of work that could complement potentially the, this work. So um, I think with that, I will thank you very much, um, Gemma, and everybody contributing. Um, I'll just uh, remind that obviously this has been recorded and it will go on, on the YouTube uh, channel of GFEI to, to rewatch it if you want to. And I think there's going to be a follow up email from um, uh, GFEI and Penny to all the participants. So um, with that, thank you very much and um, have a, a lovely rest of, of the day. Thank you.